Now, the, the sermon topic for tonight, in my opinion, it's kind of fun. Like I, this is real interesting to me. Hopefully, you're just as interested. And what I'm be preaching on is life in the afterlife. It's kind of like what you can expect in the afterlife. Because there's, there's a lot of thoughts that people have that, quite frankly, are just completely wrong and backwards and just... People have a tendency to, you know, think, oh, when I go to heaven, you know, I'm going to be able to just do whatever I want and kind of make my own world and just be able to do things that just, you know, I'm going to have this and I'm going to have that and I'm, you know, and, and people sort of just imagine and make up, you know, what heaven's going to be like for them as if you have a choice of what heaven is, you know, is going to be like. And... I think that comes from there is a lot of unknowns of, of what's going to happen. There's, there's not a lot in Scripture of very detailed, you know, imagery and certain things like that. But we're going to focus on what the Bible does say because that's what we know to be fact. And the more you know about what it does say, the more you can kind of dispel some of these other thoughts or ideas or what you might hear or maybe what you've kind of grown to believe over years just because you never really paid it a whole lot of thought anyways you know there's there's people that say you know i'm gonna have i'm gonna have my own half pipe in my backyard i'm gonna have this i'm gonna you know it's like yeah probably not <laughs> but we're also going to look at too um just the progression of things so we're not going to spend an eternity in heaven that's not our eternal destination. And we're going to go through kind of the timing of events and, and where we actually will be and where we're going to spend eternity. And from now all the way until eternity, basically everywhere along the way, we're going to look at, at where, what the Bible talks about and, and what's going to be happening. We know what to expect. God's given us this. And one of the purposes as well is to, you know, when you know what to expect, Let's get in the right frame of mind for what we're going to be doing in the future anyways and, and kind of be prepared for that and start enjoying the things that we will be doing in heaven or in the new heaven and new earth or in the millennium or whatever um, during these time periods. So let's take, to start off with... Um, we're going to get to 2 Corinthians 12 in a minute. I just kind of want to lay some real basic frameworks. Since it's life in the afterlife, we'll just deal with hell right away because that once you go there, you know, that's pretty much it. You're going to have one opportunity to come back out of hell. If someone were to die today, and we're going to start dealing with just, well, what happens when people die today? Right? right? Not in the future, not in the past, just, just if someone were to die today, their soul is going to one of two places. They're either going to heaven or hell. They either get carried by the angels into heaven, as Elijah was, as Enoch, you know, as, as other people in the Old Testament, people in the New Testament, as in Luke 16, we have a great example of, of the uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Luke 16, 22 says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So he was brought to heaven because that's where Abraham was. And Abraham was there to comfort him because he had a hard life, because he was a, a poor man, he was a beggar, he had sores, and the dogs licked his sores, and he's trying to get crumbs from a rich man's table. So Abraham was there to embrace him in his bosom. This isn't some weird compartment of hell. Abraham was being a good guy and embracing him and, and comforting him as he entered into heaven, as the angels carried him there to, to go to heaven. And then it says, the rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So, just like that, two people, one went to heaven, one went to hell. There was no in-between. People who are in hell are going to be in flames, in darkness, there's weeping, there's wailing, there's gnashing of teeth. You're surrounded by misery, you're surrounded by screams, you're surrounded by all manner of just horrible whatever you could imagine, engulfed in flames, in darkness. And the only time that they're going to come out of hell is when they stand before the great white throne, judgment of God. And they're all going to be judged based on their works. There's going to be two books open. There's going to be the book of life. And there's going to be the books of the law that are entered and say, oh, you're not in the book of life. 
So here we go, and they're going to be judged according to their works out of the law, and they're all going to come up short, and then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Because death and hell in Revelation 20, and those of you who go soul winning or, that use these passages to read this all the time, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So when this earth is ultimately destroyed and there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, and we'll get into that a little bit later, that's when hell is relocated to this lake of fire, which is outer darkness. So right now we've got the pit where hell is located. That will be relocated to the lake of fire. So for a brief moment, people who are in, if they die today and they go to hell, they will come out of hell. At the, resur at the second resurrection. Yeah. They'll be judged, and then they get cast into the lake of fire, and that's it. And it's end of story for them as far as anything ever changing. It's not going to change or be there forever. So obviously a really bad place, which is why we go out and preach the gospel. But that's pretty simple to see. We don't really need to know any more details than what we already heard, because it's, it's, it's horrible. So... And there's not too much confusion, I think, on what hell is like, other than people thinking that someone might be ruling and reigning in hell. No, no one's ruling and reigning in hell. They're all being tortured. Satan's not ruling in hell. Satan's not going to be ruling in hell. They're going to be tormented. Revelation 14 says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or no night, who worship the beast or receive the mark of his, of his name. So it's, it's people go to hell, they, they just are tormented all the time. Terrible place. But let's focus now on the good things. If you were to die today, what's going to happen? Um, well, we started off in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 because first I just want to explain that the Bible talks about three heavens. Just so people understand that you do, you know, we don't believe in this soul sleep where your soul just stays in the body and just rests on this earth until a later time in the future. We already saw the story in Luke 16, you know, where the... the the Lazarus dies and he's carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. We can see the story of Elijah going up by a whirlwind into heaven. So it's referred to heaven. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you want to look at this in verse number 2. The Bible says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So he's caught up and he goes up to the third heaven. There's the heaven, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this. There's basically heaven where it's referring to the air that we breathe, where birds fly through. That is one reference to heaven. There's the second heaven, which would be beyond that. Like I like to call that outer space, just, just out, like, like the heaven that contains the stars and the sun and the moon, you know, the heavens. And then there's the third heaven, which would be where the, the heavenly tabernacle is, where you could say God's throne is, where the things that we read about that are in heaven are. Like that's, that's the third heaven. So he's talking about someone who is caught up to the third heaven. Now, um, I haven't studied this out a lot because, you know, with timing of when this was written and when Revelation was written and stuff, this to me sounds just a lot like this is the Apostle John that he's talking about. Um, like I said, I haven't really gone in depth on, on that, but it makes sense because in Revelation chapter 4, John goes up into heaven and he also hears things because he's writing down everything he sees and then he hears something and he's like, wait, don't, don't write that down. He wasn't allowed to write down a certain, you know, a certain thing, you know, thing that he heard and saw. He was not able to record that. So it says in verse number three here, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So he heard these things. It's not lawful because he was told not to do it. So that's what it sounds like to me. And you just read through Revelation. He's, he obviously goes to that third heaven. And... Um, that would be the place that believers go if you were to die today. You get caught up, you, you are taken to that third heaven. And that is the place where God is. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 10, 14, you have to turn, if you would, to... Um, turn to Matthew 6. I'm going to try... I, I got a lot of material here. I'm going to try to blow through some of these. 
because you're probably already familiar with this, but just in regards to heaven and what the Bible describes as heaven being the place where God's throne is, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 10, 14, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. So just another reference to the heaven of heavens, which I refer to as the third, the third heaven, right? The place that people would go when they die. If you just look up the word heaven in the Bible, there's a lot of references to it, but the vast majority of those are talking about kind of like where the birds are or where the stars and the, and the sun and the moon are, like those just over and over again, the heaven, the heavens, like it just, the Bible refers to that a lot. But if you're looking for an actual description of what heaven looks like, that's a lot harder to find. You don't see a lot of that. What we see is just a very few things. So um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what, you know, the scenery around will look like. Like I could tell you what the earth, you know, we walk outside, you could see trees, there's vegetation, there's buildings, there's walls, there's a blue sky, there's clouds. You know, that's where we live now. The Bible does not give us a description of what the third heaven looks like. It just gives us a description of some things that are in heaven, like the throne of God, like the elders that are sitting before the throne of God, like these other beings, created beings that are referred to sometimes as angels or seraphim or teraphim and cherubs and like all these different other creatures that God has made that we don't see in this life here physically with our eyes that exist and they are in heaven. So there are going to be other creatures that exist when you go to heaven that you'll be able to see as well. Um, the Bible says, obviously, in... in um, that there, no, nothing can contain God. So like even the third heaven, it's something that, that we could understand where there, there are these things that are there. But God is greater than anything, any place, because he created the heavens and the earth. I mean, he created everything. So even these places that exist, God created them. So he can't be encompassed by, by what by what he's made, if that makes sense. The Bible says in 1 Kings 8, 26, And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, much less this house that I have built. So this is, you know, Solomon building this temple. It's supposed to be the house of God, right? But he's saying, I know that God doesn't just dwell like a man does in a house. Like this house can't contain you. Not even the heaven of heavens can contain God. It's not, you know, God is, is, is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. You know, you can't be contained by any of these things. But it is something that still is referred to. It says then in verse number 30, and hearken thou to the supplication of thy servants. So he's saying when we pray to this place, you know, basically that you'd hear us. And of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. So you'll find many, this is just one reference, but there's many references that where, where the dwelling place of God is in heaven. This is the place that believers will go to when they die. And of course, Psalm 11, 4 says, the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. So just giving us that information, there's a throne. God's throne is in heaven. So at least one thing when you die, what you'll see is the throne. God's throne. Um, some other verses on heaven, you're in Matthew chapter 6. Verse number 10, the Bible says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, God's will is always done. So we're on this earth right now. Is God's will always being done? No. There's crime. There's, you know, all kinds of things that are going on that is not what God intends or God wants. People do wicked things and evil things. Um, not everybody is getting saved, right? There's, there's just all kinds of things that are happening on this earth that are not God's will. It's not what he really wants. But he gave us a will to do things. But in heaven, everything is according to God's will. There is no sin in heaven. I mean, sin is ultimately what's, what's keeping this place from being in accordance with God's will, is that we have sinful men, sinful beings that are, that are just going against God's will. And God gave us the ability to do so. So, but in heaven, God's will is always being done. So that, that's actually a good thing because you, you look forward to being in a place where you don't have to worry about what someone is going to do to you ever at all 
about anything because it's all everything's being done according to God's will. And um, it's, it's, it, sounds, it, sounds like a, it sounds like heaven to me. Heaven's also a place where we can have treasures laid up for ourselves. In verse number 20 in Matthew 6, the Bible says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So we don't get a lot of information on, the tr on what the treasures really are, what form they take, but they exist. And we could pile them up and they're going to be safe in heaven because no robber is going to be able to steal and, and they're not going to go bad. They're not going to decay or, or rust or anything like that. So we can lay up treasures in heaven. Uh, of course, we know, turn if you go to Hebrews chapter 9. We're not going to go through the book of Exodus. But if you are interested in reading on all of the details of the tabernacle, you can read every single detail and what was patterned here on earth exists in heaven. So when we die, and, and if we were to die today and you go, your soul goes to heaven, you're going to see the throne of God and there's a tabernacle in heaven also that exists and we'll finally be able to see, hey, this is what we read, we, we read about in the book of Exodus that was patterned. And if you don't know what some of these things are, a chapter, and, you know, what, what, whatever some of the words are, you're like, what does that look like? I don't know about you. I've spent some time really trying to kind of figure out what everything is. You've got your tatches and your loops and your, you know, all the things holding the curtains together and, and, and just trying to get a, a visual on all that. It's not always easy to do. We're going to be able to see that in heaven. There's, that tabernacle is going to exist. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So he's referring to the sacrifices that were done in the tabernacle in the Old Testament that, yeah, they had to have those animal sacrifices, but the sacrifice that was made of Jesus Christ and his blood being sprinkled was the perfect sacrifice that was applied in the tabernacle in heaven. So there's a mercy seat. There's the Ark of the Covenant. There's all these things. There's cherubs surrounding the mercy seat. There, you know, all of the things that you see in the, book of, in, in the book of Exodus, we will see those things. If you were to die today, you'd go to heaven, you'd see those things. They're there. They exist there. Now, I don't know what our level of access is, you know, to, to, to these places in Scripture, but we know that they're there, and these are one of the, that's one of the few things we actually do know is there. Um, verse 24 says, For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh, in Revelation chapter 4, let's turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 is actually one of the, like the longest passage where we're going to see any level of detail of heaven in general because that's where, where John is caught up to heaven, where he's there in the spirit. And most of Revelation, he's seeing things that are going to happen on earth and he's seeing things as they play out, like where the angels are you know, God's pouring out wrath or, do, you know, all these different things, but they pertain to what's going to be happening here on earth. But in Revelation chapter 4, we get the details of, of just what he's seeing in heaven. So this is, as he goes up there, he's, you know, okay, here's where I'm at. This is what I start to see. And then they start to go through the, the, the book that's sealed, you know, with the six seals and, and all, all of those events after Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, I am not an expert on stones. I, pro I, 
I've tried looking them up before, but now it's, it's hard because there's so many different colors and things like for the same exact stone. And I'm just, I just don't know enough about that to get a good picture then because you start even see there's different colors, different shapes, but they're still like an emerald or they're still whatever. I, Cause I've looked up these stones before. I was like, what is that? What are you going to see? I don't know. Someone who knows a little bit more about minerals, rocks and minerals can, can probably have a better understanding of what would be a typical Jasper or Sardin stone. But we do know there's going to be a rainbow around about the throne. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be surrounded by homos <laughs> because they stole that symbol for them. This rainbow that's going to be around the throne is a glorious sight because God makes promises. You know, that, that promise of the rainbow, by the way, was just that he wasn't going to destroy the earth with a flood. But he is going to destroy it with fire. So the homos can cling to their, to their rainbow thinking that God's not going to destroy the earth again. But, it, but you're missing. He's not going to destroy it with water. You're forgetting about the fire. You're forgetting about what he did to Sodom. He is going to rain fire and brimstone down. And that rainbow is not going to protect you. It's only going to protect you from water. It's not enough. No matter how much you want to wrap yourself in the rainbow, it's not going to work. Sorry, you're probably going to be hearing a little bit more along those lines just because of the month that we're in right now. Um, it, it, it makes me sick. I'm, try, I'm trying, I'm, I'm literally trying not to preach on it because I don't like preaching on, on perverts. It's, it's just, I don't even want to think about them. But they do these things and put it in your face. So now that even when I'm reading the Bible, I'm just forced to think about some stupid perverts because they steal something that's, that's of God, a rainbow. And, and that's what comes to mind. But let's look at, uh, let's, let's get our mind off of that and think about heavenly things. <laughs> because there is a rainbow around about the throne. And one of the reasons is because God is light. God is a, like, he gives light. He has a glory. It's a Bible, when, you, when you read the word glory, the Bible is a brightness. And you'll see this glory coming from the Lord. And kind of like, you know, sometimes you'll see rainbow around the sun. Right? Certain like maybe hazy days or whatever, you kind of see that. Or other light sources, you can see a rainbow. Around. That's what I think is being described here is that, you know, from the brightness, from the glory of the Lord, then there's this rainbow surrounding the throne, which is going to, I mean, obviously it's really beautiful. It's going to look cool. Um, and then he sees, verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. How cool would that be to be one of these 24 people? I mean, 24, that's not very many at all. You think about how many people get saved over the, the course of the earth's existence. 24 people are going to be right before the throne of God, just around about the throne. There's 24 seats, and they're going to have crowns of gold because they've obviously gone through and lived you know, the way that God wanted them to and they got blessed and rewarded in heaven to be right by that throne. I mean, right by God, just so close to God to be one of those 20, uh, 24 elders. Uh, clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. So this is a, obviously a sight to behold. You've got the rainbow, God's glory, lightnings and thunderings and voices just emanating from that throne. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse number six, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So there's this, this crystal sea, uh, very clear, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So this is one of those beasts that all we have to work with is what we're, <laughs> what we're reading here. But obviously there's a lot of eyes, eyeballs, in front and in back. I'm, I'm really interested to see what they look like because... 
I don't know. I mean, but this is, this, is, this is the vision in heaven. I mean, this is what John is seeing in heaven. And it says here, so there's four beasts, but it, and it tells us what each beast looks like. So the first beast is like a lion. The second beast, like a calf. The third beast had a face of, as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So you've got these beasts that look like these various animals. They've got six wings. And what they're doing is just praising God day and night. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And one thing you notice, I don't have, I didn't go, there's a lot of scriptures I want to turn to. But one of the things you'll, you'll notice is that there's a lot of praising of the Lord in heaven. I mean, this is a great example. It's, it's going on all the time. There is singing. There's songs. He, he teaches the, you know, the, the 144,000 a new song. Um, we see other times where there are songs being sung in heaven. So we're going to be, you know, you're going to be participating in the worship of the Lord and singing songs unto his name, seeing this great sight, um, which, hey, if you're going to be singing in heaven, start singing some praise songs now, right? You can make that a part of your daily routine. Learn to like it. If you don't like it, I don't know. I mean, it's, that's one of the things that's going to be done for sure in heaven. The Bible says here in verse number nine, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So even these, these great, you know, it's these seats that, these, that God has, has honored these 24 elders with, you know, they're still humble and saying, you know, we don't, we don't deserve this, God. You deserve all the glory. You deserve all the honor. And that's the way it is in heaven. And you know what? That's the will of the Lord being done right there. That his creation is humble and serving. And ultimately, what, the, what I take away from, from heaven and really from everything in the afterlife is one of ministry and service and serving the Lord. That is what the afterlife is going to be like. It is not a vacation on a cloud. It is not, I'm going to sit in a hammock in the sun and do nothing. So if that is what your idea of heaven is like now, you're wrong. <laughs> it's just it's not what the Bible tells us at all. We're going to see, you know, as, as we have seen a little bit already, there is work that God has for us to do. And we are going to continue in service to the Lord in heaven and do whatever. Hey, we were created for his pleasure. That's, that was, that's why we were created. We are and were created for his pleasure. And we're going to continue doing that, whatever that is, in the afterlife. So learn to like serving God now. And I don't think that is like some horrible thing to learn how to do. I, I, the more you do serve God, the more you'll realize it really is a blessing anyway. That it's not something you have to, you know, it's not like you're teaching yourself to like the taste of dung or something that's just totally repulsive or something that would just, just you really have to train yourself because it's horrible. It's not like that at all. It's, and it, you know, serving God is, is something that, you only have to overcome your flesh, but once you start doing that, you realize this is actually great. I'm actually have a lot more joy and, and my life is more meaning and I'm more fulfilled when I'm serving the Lord that you want to do it more and more anyways because you realize the, the value in it and how great it is and, and how blessed you are by being able to serve God. And the more you can do that now, I think the better off you'll be eventually in heaven anyways because you'll know exactly how to, how to minister and how to serve. And, um, and that's, that is a taste of what heaven is going to be like. So it, that's if you were to die today. Now we're going to look at some other scriptures because obviously from now until Jesus comes back at the rapture, basically everyone who dies in this time, if you're a believer, you're going to heaven. 
If you're an unbeliever going to hell, we already covered that. If you're a believer you're going to heaven. Well, what happens when Jesus Christ comes back? Well, Jesus comes back, there's going to be a rapture where those of us who are alive, or are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up together in the air with Jesus Christ. We're going to have a new body. So this fleshly body that we have right now is going to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We're going to receive a new body, a, a heavenly body, a spiritual body. And then we're going to be with, with, with God, with Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have a good answer for the, because the rapture happens about the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. So there's still about three and a half years left where God's going to be pouring out wrath and stuff here on the earth. I assume we're going to be in heaven for those, those years, right? So we'll all experience heaven to some degree, even if we're still here when Jesus comes back. Because then after that, that time period, after God poured out his wrath, he's, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. And you're in Revelation 4. Turn over to Revelation chapter 11. A little bit more of what to expect in the afterlife. So you spend some time in heaven. There's not, I, I've, I've been scouring scripture and trying to think of like, where does the Bible talk about this? And we're going to go to some places in Isaiah, some other places just that talk about things in the afterlife and also piece those together. Because I think sometimes if you don't really, if you haven't really thought about it, people get confused about misapplying different scriptures and thinking that all of these things take place in heaven when that's not true. They don't all, everything that talks about the afterlife, it's not all in heaven. There's actually not a lot really told to us about it. There's more uh, detail given about the other events, like the millennial reign of Christ and the new heaven and new earth, than there is just about heaven itself. Because that's not going to be where we spend the most of our time. It's not going to be in heaven. We will spend some time there as a believer, but um, more time than not is going to be spent on earth. So during the millennial reign, the Bible says in Revelation 11:15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So when the kingdoms are delivered up to basically be the kingdoms of our Lord, where it's no longer being ruled by anyone else other than God. The God becomes a ruler of this earth. And Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem and rule over the nations of the earth for a thousand years. Now, at this point, during this millennial reign, there are going to be unbelievers still on the earth. So this isn't going to be the final destination where there is no unbelievers, where there is no sin. There will still be sin in the world, but we are going to be under the, the, the perfect rule of Jesus Christ. And the world will be different. I mean, obviously, there's going to be the after effects of all the wrath and everything that's pouring out, and there's going to be some healing, but Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning. There will be other nations that still are in submission to the ultimate authority, to Jesus Christ. They're going to have to operate that way because he's going to rule with a rod of iron. The Bible says that Jesus is going to be ruling with a rod of iron. I mean, he's he, he's not going to be just some pushover and, oh, well, he's long-suffering, merciful. You know, no, he's ruling with a rod of iron. I mean, God's law is going to be in effect, and that's the way it is. And that's the way that Jesus Christ is going to rule. So <laughs> think about that, too. When we're in the millennial reign, learn to love God's law because you will be under God's law in, during that millennium. Now, thank God we won't have the sinful flesh because our bodies will have been changed. So that's, that's really good news. We, we will love God's law because the new man loves the law of the Lord. The spirit loves the things of God. And when you have your new body, this sinful flesh is gone. You've got a new body, so there's going to be nothing really preventing you from loving the law of the Lord anyways. But hey, prepare yourself for the millennium by, by getting to know God's law because he's going to be ruling according to his law. In, um, in Revelation 11, you're still there, right? We're going to look at verse number 18. This is also the time when rewards are given out to the believers. 
uh, it's, it's at the beginning of the, of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of, the te of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. This sets up the, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And there it says there's a reward unto thy servants, the prophets. And he's going to set up his kingdom. There's going to be people that are selected to rule and reign over various parts of the world, over different areas that have been faithful to Jesus Christ. And, and the more faithful you're, you know, the Bible says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. Thou shalt be ruler over many things. He's going you know, to, the people who brought forth, you know, I gave you five talents and, and you've given five talents more. Or, you know, be thou over five cities. And, and we see these type of, of examples and parables given about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven that is, that is delivered to those that have worked for the Lord. You get rewarded for that. And we receive those rewards during this millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He's going to be sitting on the throne. Believers are ruling and reigning with him. Still unbelievers around. And ultimately at the end of this, so this is the thousand years. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to see Isaiah chapter 11, I believe, applies to this time period of the millennial reign of Christ. So we're going to see a little bit more scripture about what the earth is going to be like and what our life is going to be like during that time. Because at the, at the end of those thousand years, Satan's going to be loose from, from hell and he's going to deceive the remaining unbelievers that are still on the earth. And they're going to come against the believers, against Jesus Christ, and God's just going to just destroy them. There's not even going to be a fight. They're just going to be done. And, uh, and then that issues in the new heaven and new earth. But, but before we get into new heaven and new earth, let's look at some of these scriptures that apply to the millennial reign of Christ. Because this will also give us a good idea of what the earth is going to be like during that time, because it is going to be different. Even though it's the same earth, right? you're going to recognize the earth is still being the earth during this millennial reign. Because it is going to be the same earth that we live on right now. Uh, verse number 1 of Isaiah chapter 11, the Bible reads, And there, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Before we go any further, just pointing out this, this rod that comes out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is talking about Jesus Christ. This is a reference to Jesus Christ being of the house of David, you know, coming of that, that physical line. And because this is talking about Jesus Christ, I'm, I believe it's talking about the millennial reign of Christ. It's talking about him ruling and reigning, which he didn't do the first time he came. He didn't come to rule and reign. He came to offer him up his self, his self as a sacrifice. And at the end of the thousand years, he's delivering up the kingdom unto the Father. So if you're looking at a time where he is ruling and reigning and righteousness like this, this is going to be during the time of the millennium because that's where he's in charge before he delivers that, that power back up to the Father. So we see here he's, he's obviously judging in righteousness, judging the poor, reproving with equity for the meek of the earth, smiting the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. There's still going to be, like I said, unbelievers and wicked people that are going to end up being judged according to his law. And he's going to be a righteous judge, faithful judge. He's not a respecter of persons and, and he's going to be able to judge the causes and righteousness will reign. Um, 
Like it says in verse 5, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Verse number 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. So this is referring to even the beasts of the earth, animals. Animals are still going to exist. They're going to survive through you know, the wrath of God. And, but their nature is going to be changed from being these you know, vicious, carnivorous animals that wouldn't be able to, you would never, you, you wouldn't put like your child, your young child in a, in a bear den, right? Or, or around any of these animals, a leopard, right? And leopards eat, you know, kids referring to like a goat or whatever, you know, a young, a young goat or uh, you, you don't, you know, leopards will eat them. But here it's saying they're going to lie down together because it's not going to be their food source. They're not, they're not going to be devouring and fighting and things like that. I believe this is how the creation originally was before sin entered into the world and then death by sin and, and the curse came on the ground and everything else happened. So we're going to be living during this millennial reign in a, in a time where we're going to see the way God had intended the world to be the way God created things to be according to his will, the way that he wanted this earth to be running and, and operating and the purpose for the animals he created and things like that. Now, they had changed, right? Now, now we live in a time where there's, where there's, you know, this killing and violence even between animals. and so That's just the way it is. But that's not the way it's going to be. So even a child's going to be able to lead these animals and have no fear of getting hurt because uh, they, they won't hurt them. Verse number seven says, And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So basically, it's saying, you know, the lion right now is carnivorous, it's a meat eater. But during this time, a lion's going to go to eating grass. I don't know exactly how this is going to happen physically because there's animals that, that won't survive off of anything other than getting that meat today. Like if you were just to feed them all, you know, this type of diet, they wouldn't really exist. So I don't know if there's going to be any type of recreation or somehow during, the, you know, I, I don't know how that's all going to work out. But the Bible says it, so I believe it. And it doesn't really matter exactly how it plays out, but... We know that this is the way that, the, that it's going to be during those thousand years. Sword on earth. And I think that's going to be pretty cool, too. I mean, I've always wanted to, like, pet a lot, you know, just kind of go up to some of these creatures and just be like, what do they really feel like? I would never do that. I mean, I want to sit on the back of a lion, like, like saddle up and go riding or something. Like, that would be cool. That's not going to happen. But that might happen here, because, I mean, they're, they're not going to be vicious against you. So they're going to be animals that, that are that are coexisting now we're going to coexist during this this millennial reign with uh with people who otherwise would be or animals creatures that would otherwise be harmful verse number eight and the suckling and the, excuse me and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den so even serpents snakes they're going to not, they're not going to be biting you know, little kids or any, anybody. Everything's going to be uh, peaceful. Verse number nine, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's another cool thing, is that there's going to be the knowledge of the Lord everywhere. When Jesus Christ has set up his kingdom, everyone's going to know about God and have this knowledge and, and you won't be able to deny it. I mean, some people will refuse to accept. There's still going to be unbelievers, unfortunately, but the knowledge is going to be there. So we're not going to be fighting against ignorance like we even have to today. The knowledge will be there. Jesus Christ, I mean, he's going to be up in the, up in the Holy Mount. I mean, there he is, right? It's, it's going to be just that physical sightseeing reality that you can't see today. Um, verse number 10, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall 
be glorious. Flip back to Isaiah chapter 2. We're going to see another description during this time frame. Isaiah chapter 2, verse number 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. So people from all over the place are going to be going up to the mount to where Jesus Christ is. Verse number three, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So this is what's going to be happening. People are going to be going up there to hear from the Lord, hear the law of the Lord. What does God say for us to do? And we're going to do it. And that's going to be the attitude. And people are going to say, hey, let's go up and hear what he has for us to do. Let's hear what he has to say. Okay, according to the law of God, that's what we're going to go and do. And again, when everybody is doing the law of the Lord, of course there's going to be peace. People are doing what's right. And, and you know, again, this is another, another great example of what the future is going to hold. Verse number four, the Bible says, And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So while there will be other nations, again, they'll all be in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and there won't be any war. They just, they're, they're not even going to learn war. So it's not going to be like these standing armies and they're going to take their weapons and change them into useful tools is basically what he's saying. Is that there's, there's not going to be any need for these weapons because there's not going to be any war. There's peace. There's nothing you have to worry about. So, so the, the weapons will be turned into just something useful. And, and they're being turned into plowshares and, and, and pruning hooks. Well, if the earth is still around, there's still going to be maintenance to be done. There's going to be work to be done and trimming and doing every, you know, kind of keeping the earth and, and living in it. And, and there's going to be still a lot of work to be done. This is for a thousand years. I don't, we're not going to be spending a thousand years in heaven. I mean, I don't think Jesus is coming back after another thousand years. I don't believe that. I think he's going to come a lot sooner. I mean, I don't know when he's coming back, but I don't think it's going to be another thousand years off. So we're going to be spending way more time on this new earth than we will in heaven. So uh, this, is, this is pretty cool. And then it says in verse number five, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. He's going to be providing us, I think, physical light, but, but, but more importantly, that spiritual light, that, the guidance, the knowledge of the Lord being there and having full understanding and just having someone, having him there and having other previous believers. I mean, think about all the questions that you've had that you want to know about God's word and understanding just doctrines and truth and, and everything else, how much, how readily available that knowledge will be whether you go directly to Jesus for it or someone else who maybe already has gone to Jesus for it and just, just the knowledge is all freely there and, uh, and available, I think. That's, that's pretty exciting too. You'll just know, be able to know and to learn the truth. But, I mean, you're going to be on this earth so there's still going to be things that, are, that people are doing. Uh, now your job may be, hopefully, ruling and reigning and helping administer and, and watch over and govern other nations to, and, and tell them how to do, you know, be in charge. So the more you know about God's law now, I think the more you'll be able to be in a position to rule and reign in this millennial kingdom, to instruct this is how God's law works. This is how, you know, that kind of makes sense to me. And if you love the law of the Lord, you're going to be doing other, other works for God as well. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, and I'm going to bring up this verse. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to jump into the new heaven and new earth. Jesus brought this up. I don't know exactly where this fits in, though. He says in John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. This is either going to fall into the millennial reign or the new heaven and new earth. 
I think it is in the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. My personal opinion, that's where I think that this is. I can't prove that, that that's exactly where it is. Maybe there's a way to do it. I just don't know. I just kind of get the impression that where he's talking about a place being prepared for you. I don't know how you would prepare a place on this earth that's, that's happening in the future still, like the, you know, during that thousand years. But the heavenly Jerusalem, that, that exists right now. That new Jerusalem exists in heaven. So I, to me, it makes sense that you could go and prepare a place there because ultimately that's where we're going to be residing anyways when that, when that comes down and new heaven and new earth and that is where we're going to be. Um, uh, let me see, I'm doing on time. My, my recorder stopped, so I don't have an easy access to the minutes. We started at four. All right, let me try to get through this a little bit quicker. Revelation 21. The new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21 has a lot of detail. I mean, it has all the detail about this, basically. This is where you get all the information you want to know about where we're going to be. So you die today, you go to heaven. Whatever point Jesus comes back, you know, there's just a few more years. God's going to be pouring out his wrath. Millennial kingdom gets, gets set up. You're going to be on earth. Ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Everything's going to be peaceful. The animals will be great. That's the environment we're going to be in for a thousand years. I think, I mean, however old you are, I'm 42 years old, a thousand years on this earth. That's a long time. I mean, that's, a, it's, that's pretty cool. Think about it, you're going to be just, just living life for all those a thousand years in, in, in a great environment. But then at the end of that thousand years, when, when Satan's loosed and, you know, these people are destroyed, God's going to do away with this earth and the heaven. So there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Like the Bible says here in verse number 1, Revelation chapter 21, this is just after that great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 that talks about, you know, the dead, small and great, that second resurrection, everyone who's died, all these people who've died and gone to hell, they're delivered up, they stand before God, they're, they're cast into the lake of fire. The old heaven and earth have, have waxed old and, and they're, that's being changed into this new heaven and new earth. Verse number one, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. First heaven and earth, that's gone. It's not going to be like this anymore. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And there was no more sea. So this is what we're talking about, Brother Stephen. There's no more sea. So great, the great body, you know, sea is referred to as like ocean, things like that. It doesn't mean there's no more water because we're going to see that there's still like a river flowing through, but there is no more sea. So right now, the way that we think of our, our world, we've got land masses and these great oceans and seas. It's not going to be like that. So it's a different structure to the earth. Verse number two says, and I saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is that bride. When people talk about the bride of Christ, it's not the church. This is talking about the bride being that holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven that's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse number three, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So the tabernacle that's in heaven is going to be brought down to the new earth. And by the way, the new earth this is where we will be spending eternity. So it's not going to be in heaven. And heaven is, of, of all these places, heaven for us will be the shortest spent time. Because we have a longer time during the millennial reign of Christ here, and then an even longer time, obviously, is going off into eternity in the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth. And all the detail we get about that is here. So, I can't tell you about animals. I can't tell you about a lot of other things. The scripture just simply doesn't go into those details. So let's look at what the scripture does say. But nowhere are we seeing you're making up your own reality. You're in the holodeck and you're just living off whatever dream you want to live off. That's not what it is. Sorry for the nerd reference, but... <laughs> if, you guys, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I, I, I'm, wow, I'd be impressed. I'm glad that you don't know that. 
My kids don't know what I'm talking about right now, so <laughs> praise God for that. But um, let's keep reading here. So the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this is when, I mean, we've got God the Father now just dwelling with man, with his creation. We had Jesus Christ for the thousand years. And when it says God himself, I was talking about the Father because Jesus Christ is giving up all power and authority to the Father. And we're going to be just with the Father. We're going to have that tabernacle on earth, in the new earth. And then it says in verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is when all sorrow is gone. Now, when we get our new bodies, that's going to be a great step up from where we are now because those new spiritual bodies, we're not going to have the same aches and pains, I don't believe, that we have right now that go along with our body that ultimately decays and gets old and dies, right? So we could have physical ailments and blindness and, and other things that, that are um, detrimental to us, that, that are kind of taking back and, and cause us problems. When we get that new body, which we will at the, at the rapture, life from that, from that physical standpoint is going to be a lot better. But there's still going to be sorrow. Even during the thousand years, while everything's going to be great, you still have unbelievers. You're still going to have people that you know, aren't getting saved. And then when we witness this event of the great white throne judgment, I, I think like, I can see people while on one hand, you may be, you know, you're, you understand the judgment of God and it's righteous and, it, and it's good, right? I mean, it's, no one's going to be, no one that's saved is going to be going like, oh, I can't believe he's doing this. Of course, it's going to be righteous and good and, and it's the right thing to do. But it doesn't mean you won't be sorrowful maybe for someone who, you see that didn't get saved and you, did, you know, didn't have an opportunity to give him gospel or whatever, some family member, you know, there's going to be some sorrow. But he says at this point, though, God's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death because that's, that's now done. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. During the middle of the reign of Christ, some people are going to be dying. Not believers, because you have everlasting life, but unbelievers will be dying during that time. And I think unbelievers, some of them are going to be executed according to God's law during that time. I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to say because with the, uh, with the amount of peace there's going to be, I don't know what level of, of violence another man will do unto another man. It's kind of an interesting thought. But, um, you know, with that law being in effect, whatever is going on will be dealt with appropriately. But... Um, here, God's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So everything that has to do with the old way of life is now just, it's just changed. It's gone. It's done away with. So there's going to be no more sorrow or anything, no more pain. We're going to be living in this, in this new city, New Jerusalem. And... Um, Verse number five says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Again, the Lamb's wife, this bride, is not the church. When he's showing him the, the, the bride of Christ... Look what he shows him. Verse number 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So when he shows him the bride, he shows him a city. He shows him the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And what does it look like? It says that... Um, it, it, it has the glory of God, which means it's bright. 
It's shining. Her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Verse 12, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So I, I find it interesting, you know, I, not to get real political here, but like with the whole wall thing, you know, how people get all upset about the wall and it's like, this is a big deal. God's going to have a wall <laughs> surrounding this new Jerusalem. And what's funny, we're not even going to need a wall. There's not going to be anyone to like come and, and, I mean, who's left? All of the unbelievers are, are gone. They're in the, the lake of fire and there's no getting out of the lake of fire. But God decided he wants to have a wall around around the new Jerusalem. So it's the way it'll be. So there's going to be this wall, great and high, and at 12 gates, and at the, 12, at the gates, 12 angels, and names written thereon, to the names of the tri 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. So on the gates of this wall, there'll be three, right? So it's a square. Basically, it says there's, there's four squares. There's the length and the width are the same size. But when we get to that length and width, I never did the math on this until just recently. It's huge. Okay, this is huge. Huge, huge. You're going to love it. It's a huge wall. <laughs> You're not going to see a better wall than this wall. I'll tell you what. And we're not even going to have to pay for it. <laughs> so there's three gates on each side. It's a square. And the wall of the city, it said, had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 15, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square. So it's a square. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and the height of it are equal. So it's kind of like a cube. But... A furlong, and again, if, if this furlong, I didn't do all this research, if a furlong is basically the same unit of measure today as it has been when the Bible is written, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be, is about an eighth of a mile. That's what it measures. This says it's 12,000 furlongs. That's 2,750 miles, roughly. Okay, 2,750 miles for one side. And then you have another 2,750 miles going the other way, right, and, and making a big box, a big square for a city. You know, we think of a city, it's like well, the city of Atlanta. This isn't anywhere close to that distance. That distance, just so to, to put in perspective for you, 2,700 like road miles is the distance from Atlanta to Seattle, Washington. So going all the way up to the northwest side of the country from here is roughly 2,700 miles. So it's a little bit more than that. And those are road miles, which is going to take you, you know, on these, well, it's not like a straight shot. Like if you just did a straight line linear, you, you'd, you'd be going even further than that. So to put that in perspective, that's a pretty massive city. Now, it ought to be. It makes sense if every believer that's ever lived throughout history is going to be dwelling in the New Jerusalem, that makes sense. But it's also going up high, too. So who knows how it's all going to be exactly laid out with where you live and what's functioning, like on maybe different levels and you know, things going up. But um, that's pretty neat. This is, this is what the Bible describes about the New Jerusalem. So this is quite the city. And then in verse 17, it says, He measured the wall thereof in 140 and 4 uh, cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. So that's 20 stories tall, basically. A cubit's about a foot and a half, so 216 feet, about roughly 20 stories. You know, stories approximately a little over 10 feet. So if you're thinking about like a 20-story tall building, right? This is, you know, one story, and then two, three, four, uh, 20. That would be the height of the wall going round about. So pretty big city. And then it says, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And, and well, just one more point, though, you know, continuing on. Think about all the, the, the openness 
you have in the drive from here to Seattle, just all this open land and open space and stuff, even though we have however many people living on the, you know, on the earth right now or living in the United States, it's not that hard to imagine when you start thinking of something that big in a, in a territory or a city make it, taking up such a large space. I didn't do that. I'd like to do this linearly, actually, to see how does that, how does the four square compare to the, like, North America as a continent? Does that whole thing fit roughly on there? I don't know. What? I think it's a little bit, a little bit bigger. Bigger than North America? It's got to be pretty close, I would say, pretty close, right? I mean, because I mean, North America is shaped not in a, in a square either, right? So you might be cutting off some corners with some C's or whatever, but um, it's a pretty big, pretty sizable city, and, that, and that's where eternity is going to be spent. This is, this is what, we're, what we're looking forward to and as, as all of eternity being spent in this new Jerusalem. It says in verse number 18, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. So that's pretty neat too, that the, 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 the wall is just built of, it says it's built of jasper and the city is, is pure gold, like unto clear glass. Verse 19, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst. And again, I, I tried looking all these up in the past, and I don't know, I really don't know what it's going to look like, because I've seen all different colors come up for these different stones. Because I'm thinking, like, there's probably going to be one color for each, you know, these, these foundations. No matter what, what I get out of this is going to be pretty beautiful. Yeah. It, it just sounds like it's going to be a magnificent place. Just kind of glittery, shiny, like, just, just clean city that... Uh, this is the street, verse 21, and the 12 gates were, uh, were 12 pearls. Every silver gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. So that's kind of cool, too. Now, I, and I don't understand, you know, gold in its pure form is still like a yellow metal, right? But here it's talking about pure gold just being like so pure it's clear. And it's just going to be a clear glass. Um, pretty cool. Transparent glass. Verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. Remember, the, the, the heaven and the earth were passed away. So, so we don't have the, the sun, the moon, the star, like all the, the, all the heavens are just done away. Like that's done. So we're not going to have the same morning. And I, I don't know how sleep is going to work out. Are we going to need to sleep? I don't know. Can't answer that one. But, um, but God is going to be the light. The Lamb is the light thereof. Verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this is still being set up, mind you, on the new earth. I mean, this is a, city, it's a big city, but it's being set up on this new earth. And since there's gates that are going to be used and, you know, people are going to be coming in and out of the city, there's still, sounds to me like there's still nations in this new earth that are going to exist. And this also demonstrates, you know, the, the rewards that you get and the things that you do in this life really matter because not everyone even necessarily is going to be in, and I might have misspoke earlier, is going to be living in this city, although they probably could. There's probably enough space for everybody to. It's probably the way that God made it so that anyone, everyone could, but not everyone will. Again, there's, there's a little bit more conjecture there, but um, 
there is going to be the, you know, these, the kings of the nations, you know, entering into the great city, this new Jerusalem that, uh, that was prepared. And look at Revelation chapter 22, verse number one. The Bible says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So, uh, oh yeah, the last, verse number three there, I just wanted to make this point, because I, I brought it up earlier, but just so you could see it in scripture. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. This is what's going to be done. You say, what am I going to be doing for eternity? Serving God. Servants shall serve him. That's what we're for. That's what we're here for. And that's what the Bible says all the way here, the last chapter of the Bible, going off in eternity. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be serving the Lord. All of that said, you know, hopefully that clears up maybe any, any misunderstandings. I, I know there's not a lot of detail there. It's the best I'm able to do with what I understand and what we can see in Scripture of kind of envisioning what the future is going to hold for us, what it's going to be like. But what I take away out of this is let's learn... To, to serve the Lord, to love His law, to love His commandments, to, to love singing and praising His name, to love everything about serving the Lord because we're going to be doing that for forever. That's what we're going to be doing anyways. If you don't really like doing it now, learn to like it. <laughs> because if you're saved, that's what you're going to be doing. And it is possible to, to like serving the Lord because it, it actually is a good thing to do and it, and it is rewarding, fulfilling and the more you do it you'll realize yeah, this is way better than any other alternative of what you can spend your time doing and what you could do with your life. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for all the, the information that you, you've given us. We thank you mostly for the, the free gift of eternal life. Lord, and, and we know that whatever it is, these glimpses of the future that we have, our minds are not ever going to be able to fully comprehend the, the great things that you have prepared for us just because your words told us so, that, that anything that we could think of is not going to compare to what the reality of, of these places are going to be like. God, we thank you so much for loving us and for being long-suffering and merciful and for giving us the free gift of eternal life, God. We, we, we thank you for that. I pray that you please help us to walk in the Spirit and, and to serve you better and to learn how to, how to serve you better and to um, just be good ministers here on earth and help us to keep the right mindset focused on the things that are in heaven so we could lay up our treasures there while we're here that will last us for this eternity that you've prepared for us, dear God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.